Good morning. Happy Sunday. Is it beautiful outside? Is it beautiful inside with all uh, these beautiful faces? Yes, it is. Especially in God's sight, which is the sight we should be looking at. Let's stand one of our great hymns of the faith. Oh, how wonderful, oh, how marvelous is my Savior's love for me. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you in church today. We just uh, got done with our uh, first Sunday of our new and perspective and existing member class uh, down in the gym. Had a great group. Many of you were there. Uh, would, if you want to join that class, we've still got three Sundays left. Invite you back uh, to join us in the gym uh, this coming Sunday. Those of you who are new, we've got a, a welcome connect card in the pew rack there. We'd love for you to Fill out the welcome card so we can know who you are and be able to personally thank you for coming to church. Uh, Kids, we're glad that you're in the room today. We're going to have worship bags for you. This is not for big kids, only for uh, 10 and under, I think. But we've got some great uh, worship bags full of stuff for you to uh, look through during the sermon. We'll hand those out uh, during Pastor Powell's. First, we want to turn our attention to the Lord's Supper the next uh, moment that we'll have here in our church. Our theme in church today is about, in general, becoming a church member. Not even anything about this church yet. We're just going to ask today, is joining a church a biblical idea? Where does church membership even come from? We had, uh, like I said, a wonderful class this morning just beginning to think about it. 
Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is frustrated about how the church membership is celebrating the Lord's Supper because they are not valuing all the members of the church equally when they celebrate the Lord's Supper. The church was prioritizing the rich. If you want to turn with me, uh, find 1 Corinthians 11 in a copy of God's Word. We're going to read along a portion of this in just a moment. But what's happening here is the church is not being considerate of each other. The church is not seeking to walk in forgiveness and peace with one another. The church is making the Lord's Supper about favoritism and excluding people. And Paul calls this carelessness with the members of the church being guilty of the body and blood of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before, but what he's talking about is taking care of your members. Let's read together 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 17. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together for the, not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. I don't feel this way about you, First Baptist Santa Fe. This is just how Paul felt about the Corinthians. But there's a lesson in here. 1119. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink, or do you despise the church of God? And shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. This is God's word. It's all from 1 Corinthians 11, if you miss, miss that. This is the passage that I normally quote when we come to the Lord's Supper, and I wanted you to hear all of it in context today. What he's talking about is that when we take communion in an unworthy manner, what that means is that we have let go of relationships in the church. And we're not holding them tightly. We're not seeking to live at peace and in forgiveness with those in our church. Paul is, is teaching us that when we take the Lord's Supper wrongly, it's not necessarily because of a particular sin in our life. The context of what he's talking about is relational sins within the church. So when we come to the Lord's table, we commune with the Lord we also commune with each other. And it's one of the most important reasons that we think about our relationships within the church as we come to this table. Later in that same passage, Paul commands, So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. We're going to talk about one another's in a minute. Be considerate. He says, uh, 1134, If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. In other words, this meal we're about to eat, in case you are confused on this matter, is not about getting full. It's a little cracker. It's a little cup of juice. The meal is about feasting on the grace of Jesus Christ together, spiritually. Church membership and communion are certainly connected. We're talking about membership together. Together as a church, we commune with Christ and with one another. The story of the gospel is that Jesus Christ has submitted, substituted himself on the cross to give saving grace to all who would come to him and turn from their sin and believe on Jesus to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever 
believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. All of us are alike in our need for God's grace. And all of us are alike in being able to fully receive all the grace we need if we come to Christ and believe on him to save us. As we take communion today, we remember this is not a personal celebration. We have to be careful with Western individualism that says religion should just be this private thing only between you and Christ. There is an intimate relationship in between us as individuals and with Christ. That intimacy is important and it's good. But also in the Bible is getting involved in the lives of others in the church. Paul is telling this church that they haven't cared for each other enough. They're not caring about each other as they gather at the table. It's at the Lord's Supper that Jesus commands his disciples on that very first Lord's Supper in John 13, a passage we were just looking at this morning. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Do you know Jesus said that at the very first Lord's Supper? That's when he said it. He said, by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. We are never commanded to take communion alone, but together. Sometimes we take it to shut-ins because they can't physically be here with us. But even then, still, that deacon or whomever is an emissary of the body of Christ coming to that person and bringing them into the fellowship. Together, we are to gather and take communion as a church and consider our relationship of grace that Jesus has given us both as individuals and as a body. We are together the receivers of all the grace we need in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, as we take communion today, maybe for the last time at these four stations... We thank you so much, Jesus, for going to the cross on behalf of our sin. Thank you for reconciling us to God, our Father. We pray, Lord, that you would help us always to consider how we can improve in our relationships inside of your body. Thank you for this opportunity to take communion together and to be reminded of what you said that first communion. A new commandment I give you. Love one another, even as I have loved you. It's amazing to think about how you sacrificed your life to love us. And that you call us to love one another with that same commitment. Jesus, we come to your table remembering all you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. As we take communion, we ask that you meditate at your seat about all that Christ has given us. And when you feel ready, come to one of the four stations around the room and take communion with us. Go ahead and eat the bread uh, right there at the station. Uh, The bread is gluten-free, but you might have to uh, hit it on your hand to pop that uh, piece of bread out. Uh, Static electricity is stronger than the bread. It's so small. And uh, then drink the cup right at the station and then toss the the trash at the the receptacles that are at those stations. We invite all all who are Christians who are in good standing with their local church to take communion with us today. For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this. In remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Meditate at your seat, and when you're ready, come to the table.
that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change One thing remains One thing remains Your You may be seated. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kirk Peterson. I'm a deacon here at uh, First Baptist. This is Mark Ruse, a yoke fellow. And uh, I just wanted to say first that uh, I'm so blessed to have friends, friends here at First Baptist and blessed to have a wonderful family and blessed to have Jesus. Here's Mark to pray. For our visitors and guests, just another reminder, if you could please uh, have a chance to fill out that Connect card in your pews or in your bulletin and drop that off on your way out this morning for our members. Remember, there's multiple ways to give our tithes and offerings. There's uh, offering plates at both of the exits. You can mail in um, your donations and also Online, you can give as well. You know, as we enjoy this beautiful time of the year in Santa Fe, the cool mornings, the warm afternoons, the magnificent sunsets, as we saw last night, um, just remember the time of harvest. Um, and in the farming environment, um, that is the time that the farmers reap the harvest and give to the Lord. I just want to share two verses from the third chapter of the book of Proverbs. We read these verses uh, in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. And then in verse 9 we read, Honor the Lord with your wealth from the first fruits of all your crops. So join me in prayer this morning. Lord God, you are magnificent, holy. You give all things. You sustain us in all ways. Everything that we have is from you, Lord. We thank you for the bountiful blessings of life and health and wealth and crops and friends and family. We just pray that you would use these offerings today to further your kingdom, to bring more people in Santa Fe to know you, to deepen our walk with you as well. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. I'll uh, take just a moment of personal privilege, if I may, and just uh, express my gratitude and uh, how blessed I am by the, the love, the generosity, uh, the appreciation that uh, you showed me uh, on pastor appreciation, those gifts and uh, expressions. Um, I am humbled. I'm grateful, I'm blessed, and uh, I uh, love and appreciate you folks. I am also grateful uh, and humbled by the quality of the musicians we have up here. Uh, I uh, much enjoy having others lead out on some of the songs, like Karen, who just led with goodness of God. Diana will uh, be leading here shortly in Strong God. You have a treat next week, uh, first of all. Marco, who is not here today, having some back issues, uh, our lead guitarist, he will be leading next week uh, for our praise and worship uh, because your humble minister of music will be in prison. So, I am active, uh, thanks to Rick Wilminko, many years running now with Kairos Prison Ministry. Uh, we are an interdenominational, multi-denominational Christian group that uh, meets with inmates over a four-day period in prison uh, to, first of all, teach them the basic tenets of Christianity, accountability to one another, accountability to their families and their friends, and most of all, accountability to God. And uh, the prayers and uh, being that it will change their lives as it changed ours as well. 
And so I and the Kairos Prison Ministry team, I'm in charge of the music, what a surprise, will be in Santa Rosa at the Guadalupe County Correctional Institution from Thursday through Sunday. So Marco has graciously agreed to lead music, and I wish I could be here to sit out there and be a part of it or, or play along with him as he leads, but I'll see it on Facebook. Thank you for allowing me that uh, opportunity is to be part of that ministry and uh, the gift of all these talented musicians that I'm privileged and a pleasure to be up here with. Amen. I appreciate them more than you know. Diana will be leaning out now on one she's done before, Strong God. If y'all could please stand. adults that uh, maybe are a little insecure and want to be with their kiddos. Come down and sit beside me. Kiddos, welcome. We love you guys. 
Do you guys know who some of the most important members of our church are? Pastors? Oh, good guess. Thank you so much for that. I like that answer. Uh, you know what I was looking for is everybody. We're all equal in the sight of God. And that includes you guys. You are some of the most important members of our church. We love communion Sundays because you guys stay with us in worship. You guys see everybody coming to get the bread and the cup. Did you guys see that while that was happening? We encourage you on communion Sundays. Ask your parents, why are you doing that? What that's what's that about? We want you to ask that. And uh, we're going to have extra grace one Sunday a month for you guys to stay with us in church the whole day. Church, aren't we going to have extra grace one Sunday a month when our kids are in here with us? We love you guys, and uh, as your parents teach you to worship one Sunday a month, we pray that you will learn how to sing and how to give and how to listen to God's Word. Uh, we, we're okay with you if you need to wiggle a little bit. That's why we have these cool worship bags that our kids' ministry provides for you during the sermon time. You can have something to look at. And we also hope you'll learn, actually, to eventually be quiet in church. And that's important to learn how to not distract other people from worshiping to sit still. We want you to learn that, sure. But kids, we love you so much. We've decided to put something very important on you to give you a responsibility today. Do you know what that is? This church family is working on giving you guys a big playground to play on. Did you know that? Yeah, we are. And uh, your uh, your teachers and moms will be able to take you out to the playground if you need to run around. Won't that be great? Teachers and moms to have a playground to take these kids to run away, uh, to run, not run away, to run on. But we've been doing a, a series of sermons about how important all the members of our church are. And, and the thing is. Us older folks don't run as much as we used to. We're probably not going to use the playground as much as you guys are. So today, kids, we want you guys to vote on which playground looks the most fun to you. So in your worship bag, I just pulled this out. There's a slip of paper like this. And it has one, two, three underneath uh, three different versions of a playground. So all of you get this. It's in your thing. We want you to circle your first choice playground, your second choice playground, and your third choice playground. You can see it up on the screen behind me, church family. We are going to weight your decisions more than the rest of our church family because you guys are going to play on the playground. Isn't that cool? Yeah, we're excited to see what you guys pick. So I want you to, to make sure and vote. We'll do this with any of our kids that missed today. We'll, we'll try to follow up with them the best we can. Romans 12, 5 says we are individually members of one another. Kids, did you know the church is not a building? The church is a group of people. And we want you guys to know that you are an important part of this group of people called First Baptist Church. We love you guys. Would you guys help me by voting on the playground? Once you circle your number in worship today, if you'd put that folded piece of paper in one of the offering plates as you leave so we can count your vote for the playground. Does that sound good? All right. Thank you guys so much for helping us. Let's pray and I'll let you get your worship bag and go. God, we thank you for these important members of the First Baptist Faith family. We ask that you'd bless them. We pray for the name, for the day that every child in our faith family would call you Lord Jesus. God, we pray that every one of them would, that they would be baptized and learn to share their faith with others. More than anything, we pray that they would know that we love them and especially that you love them. Every time they play on this new playground, when it comes in, I pray that it would be a a small, maybe even a big symbol of how much you care for them, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, here, Will, you can take that back. That's your back. Oh, you want a red back. Okay, go get a red back. We're going to hear our scripture read. Come on, Dan. All right, there we go. Yeah, that's good. Good morning. Thank you. Would you please stand for the reading of God's instruction? This is uh, from Acts 2, 41 through 47. 
And I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And, sex, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I, indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. may be seated. Father. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Thank you, Dan, for that great scripture reading and musicians. That was beautiful. I want to echo what Randy said. Church, thank you for loving on your pastors. Uh, we felt it and we really do appreciate it. Have you ever heard someone say or have you said I love Jesus, but not the church. Maybe you've heard someone say, I love Jesus, but not organized religion. Maybe you feel this way. I'm familiar with these words because I used to say those exact words. I love Jesus, but not the church. That's before I worked for a church. I can understand why people feel that way. I think there are at least two main reasons. Everyone, and I mean everyone in a church, is a sinner. A lot of times people say this because one or two people from a church somewhere have hurt them. But the truth is the church is 100% sinners. In other words, we're much worse than we think we are. The whole point in loving a church is loving messed up people because that's how Jesus feels about his bride. Pastor Alistair Begg often tells people looking for a church, if you find a perfect church, don't join it because you would mess it up. We're all sinners in the church. That's no excuse for us continuing to sin against one another, to harm each other. Jesus teaches us to grow and get better, be perfect as my father in heaven is perfect, he tells us. And he teaches us what to do when we've been sinned against. He has a plan. And second, I think connected to the fact that we're all sinners is that our flesh does not like to be under any kind of authority or accountability. We barely want Jesus to be our Lord, let alone to do life with others who might hold us accountable to the teachings of our Lord. So this is not just the complaint of a few, but something that people are prone to say throughout history. In America, we're big on individualism, and that can be good in work ethic and some other things to be individualistic. But biblically, we have to recognize there can be a downside to individualism. And is that, that's that we often don't prioritize the community. And that really brings us to this question that I want us to ask today. Why should I join a church? Is church membership even biblical? 
I mean, isn't membership for Costco? Why are you asking me to join FBC? I don't understand. And we're going to take this question in this way. We're not even going to talk about FBC today. We're, we're not talking about joining our church. We're only talking about joining a church. So in our series, we're taking a break from Luke. Uh, what is the church? Remember last week, we looked at the first usage of the word church in the entire Bible. Jesus' promise to build the church in Matthew 16. And we learned the Greek word for church, ekklesia, means assembly or gathering for a purpose. As the world emerges from quarantine, it's important to remember that we are commanded to gather, to be the church. We have to come together. We can't do the church by ourselves in the living room. That's not what church is. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to shift from what I did last week and normally do where I exegete one passage, and we're going to have some topical messages on answering these different questions. So today is why join a church. Next week, why join a Baptist church? What in the world is that? Uh, The third week will be why join our church? FBC Santa Fe will look at our history and where we're going. And finally, we'll ask, how can I get involved at FBC Santa Fe. So today, why join a church? And the first thing I want to say in answer to this question is you are welcome to visit First Baptist Church for as long as you want. We're not going to kick you out because you don't join. No way. We, you are welcome here. We want you here. We believe in church membership. We're going to talk about it today. But people are welcome at FBC, period. All kinds of people, all kinds of sinners. You are welcome here. We do have one caveat for welcoming everybody into our corporate gathering, and that's that you can't come in in such a way that you would distract other people from worshiping. So you can't come in and protest this or that. You can't come in falling down drunk when it would be such a distraction to others in the room. All sinners are welcome to come and hear what Jesus teaches. That's what we want. But we do believe that as a person comes to know Jesus, and I mean seriously, if you have really become a Christian, changes will start to happen in your life from the inside out. Can't do life the same anymore. And one change that will happen is you will want to care about the bride of Christ. As Jesus resides in you, An overflow of that will be a love for the local church. So what do you think? From where do we get church membership? Do we get this from Costco? And we're trying to then push it on to you. Uh, You pay to get free samples at Costco. Costco and toilet paper in the thousand roll package. And here you pay to get donuts. No, we do church membership because the Bible teaches it. The Bible teaches us to become members of a local body. And I know sometimes it's hard to see it. And so my goal in this topical message is to try and help us see that, to help uncover it a little bit. The biblical nature of church membership starts with becoming a Christian. Notice on your sermon notes first, church membership is biblical because of what it means to be saved. The story of the Bible is that our greatest need is God. We are built for a relationship with our creator. I'm talking all humanity. Each of our greatest needs is to know God and worship him. We will search for him and fill that spiritual need with many things, but none of those things will satisfy besides God himself. Our sickness of heart drives a wedge between us and God. And the gospel is that the whole reason Jesus came is to reconcile us to God. By dying the death that he died on a Roman cross, he paid for our sin. And if we will believe on Jesus to save us and repent of sin, he will become our Lord, our God, and he will reconcile us to God. I wonder if someone here is waiting on a day to become a Christian. I invite you to do that today, to admit your sin to God and believe on Christ to save you and follow him as your Lord. That's how you become a Christian. And the Bible says about that process, 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old has passed away and behold, the new has come at second Corinthians five seventeen. By the way, I'm going to mention a ton of scripture verses today. You might just write down them, the, just the, the address. If you want to look them up later, a lot of them are on your sermon notes. It's kind of a study guide. So you can look at this later. But when we meet Jesus, like I already said, he begins to change us from the inside out. And we automatically join at that moment the church universal. I'm not going to get into it a lot today, but there are a few places in the New Testament where the New Testament is clearly teaching about a universal church all over the world. Everybody who knows Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But we show our conversion. We show that we do know Christ, fruit of knowing him, when we get involved with the church local. We can't really love the universal church, can we? We can't do any actions towards them, can we? The the church universal is also called the invisible church by theologians. You know that? Why is it called the invisible church? Well, because nobody can see it except Jesus. It's all over the world. But the visible church is called by theologians the local church. You guys, I can see you. I know you. I know some of your names. I know some of what's going on in your lives. The local church helps us understand conversion and helps give testimony to the fact that we are converted when we get involved and start loving people here because Jesus loves his bride. And then we, as we love him, start loving his bride. There are several metaphors in the New Testament for the, the church. One of them is the bride of Christ, what I just mention. Uh, another one is the flock of God. We're, we're sheep. Another one is the spiritual temple of God. We together become, we are the church, not the building, but us as a gathered people. And each person is an important brick in the temple of God. We are another metaphor. We are the body of Christ. You guys, if you know your new Testament, those metaphors should sound a little bit familiar to you. And again, as we saw last week, all of these metaphors insinuate the church has to gather. Think about these metaphors, how they don't make sense if we're just going to stay off by ourselves somewhere as a Christian. A sheep by itself is not a flock, is it? It's solo. Christians are never called to stay solo. A brick by itself is not a building of any kind, is it? We have to gather to become the temple of God. A body part alone is not a body, is it? We have to gather to be the body of Christ. Think about the problem if I severed my hand off and left it in my room at my house and then came to church. Is my hand back at my house? Is it still my hand? Well, yeah, but there's just kind of two problems, isn't it? My hand will die and I'd probably die if I didn't get some medical attention but because my body brings my hand, blood and oxygen and nutrients, everything it needs for life and being the best hand it can be. We all are parts of the body of Christ. And to be that part, we have to join in with the body. But there's another reason that the severed hand is a problem. If I had severed my hand and left it at my house, who else would suffer? The hand, but also my body. Because I don't have a hand. That's a part that God has given me to do all kinds of important tasks. And I can't do those tasks if the hand is not involved. And so each of us as parts of Christ's body have roles to play in the body that if we're not playing them, the body is suffering and missing out. So often when Christians say, I I love Jesus, but I don't love organized religion of the church, they're looking at it as if that group is supposed to be a benefit to them. We are such consumers in America today, aren't we? We're used to everything being about us. And oftentimes when people are, quote unquote, church shopping, they're looking for the church that can provide them the greatest benefits. And I will say that's a part of our role to love each other, to minister to one another. That's important. But a huge part of looking for a church is asking, where can I be used? It's a crucial part of what it means to be in a church is to serve, to use my gifts that God has given me. 
Church membership is biblical because Christians will want to be served and helped and discipled and loved by others. And Christians will want to get involved and play their part in helping and serving and discipling and loving others. But there are several other reasons to join a church. Church membership is biblical because of our salvation. Second, because of the counting and lists in the New Testament. The New Testament church knew who was in and who was out. Church membership is is a list of who's in. They actually kept lists in the New Testament. So Dan read for us Acts 2.41. You might want to look at that passage um, here in just a minute. Or you can open there right now. And it says this. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Well, how can they be added if there's not something to add them to? And how can they add them if they don't know who's in and who's out? They're able to count. They were able to actually count the number of people who committed to the church. There was a clear entrance process. This pattern occurs all throughout the book of Acts where people believe, they get baptized, and they commit to the work of the church. That's the entrance process. They believe They get baptized and they become a part. They enter the church. Those who received his word, Acts 2.41, they believed, they received it. It became a part of their life. They were second baptized and they were added. The rest of Acts 2.42, you can read it. It talks about everything they did in the church. And you'll notice there's a great mutual commitment to one another. Believe and get baptized, and then they commit themselves. They're saying, hey, I'm in with you guys. I'm a part of this flock. Incidentally, there are three requirements to join our church, and they are those exact three things. To believe on Christ to save you, to be baptized by immersion publicly, that you chose, you weren't a child where your parents chose it, but you were choosing it. You could have been younger And three, to attend our new members class at some point. Uh, You can do that before you join or after you join at some point. Uh, You can join it right now, next Sunday, 915 in the gym, if you want to come to the new member class. Come on. Church membership does not mean you can write a dissertation on the church, that you know everything about it. You can debate theology. Church membership is not an advanced degree in the church. It just means you're saying, hey, I'm in. You might be a brand new Christian. You're saying, hey, I'm in. I don't know what to do, but I want this church to help me know what to do. I want to be a sheep of this flock. Another list of church members happens in the next passage there in number four, Acts 4.4. 4. It says, but many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about five thousand and that in that context they're talking again about how they commit to each other there's other lists of people in the church in Acts 6 and 1 Timothy 5 that you have listed there you can read those later if you want so when we have our church membership directory that you may have seen that has pictures in it it very much is a biblical practice to know who's in and who's out and to have mutual accountability and care for one another in the church. A third reason church membership is biblical, there was mutual expectation of Christians in the church or membership. Man, don't we need that today? It's so easy in the world we live in to not commit to anything or anybody. We're shirking responsibility these days. We're, we're, you know, people are lucky if we say, are you going to be at the party? Well, maybe, you know, we'll see how I feel. It's like, well, I just, I'd kind of like to know if you're going to be at the party. I will see, we'll see how it goes, you know, whatever. Isn't that us today? Just so unwilling to commit. The Bible calls for something different. In 1 Corinthians 5 is a passage you have listed there uh, that Dan read for us. It says, it's actually reported there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. A man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? And catch this. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So you see, they knew who was in and who was out. And there there was a boundary around the church. Let this guy be removed and the lady. And it's clear that they're telling this couple, listen, if you this isn't right. If you won't turn from this, and we've got a process for for how you turn, and it's very slow, and there's a lot of grace, but if you are going to continue in this sin no matter what happens, and you're just committed to it, 
we, we're going to remove your membership. And that doesn't mean that we're going to tar and feather you and hang you from the bell tower out in front of the church. It just means, hey, we're not sure you're a believer. You know, so when people say church membership, they, they often think, you know, Costco gym membership. You pay even if you don't go to the gym. Pay to play or pay not to play. It's not that at all in the church. We're talking about this reality that's behind what Paul is saying here in First Corinthians, that there's a belonging here. There's an understanding of who is in and who is out. And I would say this, if I'm sleeping with my stepmom and I call myself a Christian, shouldn't I want someone to come to me and say, Reed, that ain't right. I think a believer in Jesus Christ would say, I want that accountability. I want someone to come and say, brother, this is wrong. So there's a mutual commitment. Uh, in 1 Timothy 5, 9, another passage there, they keep a list of the widows in the church. They know the widows for whom they're responsible. They actually have a pretty complicated list because they know which widows have family that could take care of them. And they understand that that should happen first. Granted, it's an imperfect system, these lists. It's human. But see, that's what it means to be in the bride of Christ, to learn to love other imperfect people. So many people say, I love Jesus, but not the church. But that's just it. Jesus loves those imperfect people in the church of whom I am one. He cares for us and he's patient with us. And that's what he calls us to be with each other. Mark Dever is a pastor I respect very much. He's at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., just a couple of blocks from the Capitol. He often gets invited to events, you know, with uh, politicians. And he was at a black tie dinner with uh, one of his members. And this member said, hey, I want you to come meet Senator so-and-so, this lady senator uh, in our nation's capital. And, and Mark said, hey, my name is Mark Dever. I'm pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist Church. And he said this lady's lip just curled up. Well, that was weird. Just curled up in disgust. And she said, oh, you're a Christian. I can't stand you Christians. You're all just snakes. And Mark Dever said to this lady senator, he said, you know, is the world any different? He said, you know, I think people in the world are pretty much snakes to each other, aren't they? And he said, the truth is, our Bible in the church tells us, in fact, that we are all snakes. We use the word sinners. But he said to her, he said, you know, I'm a snake. The Bible would say, you're a snake. And that all of my church are snakes. And so I want you to know, you're welcome to slither on in anytime. <laughs> what the speaker fails to see when they say, I love Jesus, but not those disgusting people in the church, is that the speaker too is a sinner. The speaker, too, is a sinner who God is trying to patiently woo to himself. The difference in the church is not that we're all perfect, but that we should be the community of the redeemed who know we're not perfect. We have that knowledge that we fall short and we're trying to grow. That's who we're to be in the church. We're going to learn to forgive and to work with each other as we might step on each other a little bit in the church. And we, if we don't like somebody in the church, we should really look at our own heart and say, why don't I like that person in the church? What does that say about me? A person that's older than me or younger than me or you know, maybe a different ethnicity than me. Why am I having a hard time loving that person? And it should cause us to grow as we learn in a, in a committed relationship of love to love those people. The covenant inside of a church is not as exclusive, but it's similar to the covenant inside of a marriage. God is all about love, yes, but it is committed love that God is all about. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of my favorite authors. He's an amazing book. It's a tiny little book on the church. It's called Life Together. Life Together. And he says this in that book. He says, God hates visionary 
dreaming in the church. God hates visionary dreaming in the church. What he means is, if we were going to dream about what our church could be, it better not be that we're dreaming about how we could get those people that are not cool or that we don't like out of our church. God put those people in our church for us to love them. He writes that he's a German pastor in the middle of the Nazi domination of Germany. And he wrote that book, Life Together, kind of as a reflection on how German Christians, if they could have even one other Christian in prison, they fared so much better because they had that fellowship with other believers, other redeemed, imperfect people. Bonhoeffer says that if you are put in the church, even those people's sinful proclivities are given as a blessing to your growth in Christ. It's pretty amazing and deep thought to think about. Another clear example of church membership happens in Matthew 18. I think I didn't put this passage down, but you might want to write down Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. This may be a familiar passage, but listen to it about the church. If your brother sins, Jesus says, go and show him his fault in private. This is the pattern for conflict in church. It has to be in private first. The person who feels offended to the offender. Go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more. So that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, again, Jesus is not saying tar and feather the person. That's not how Christians are to treat Gentiles or tax collectors. The person writing Matthew happened to be a former tax collector. We're to love people outside of the church, too. We're to love them in the church. But Jesus is telling us, let that person be considered outside the church. Again, an understanding of a defined body of the church, church membership. Now, this command has to be done carefully. There's always the focus on forgiveness and restoration in the church. And in fact, that's what he goes into. If you read after Matthew 18, 13 to 17, he goes right in to forgiveness, a beautiful passage about how crucial that is in the church, because we're all we all make mistakes. So forgiveness has to be right on our heart with other church members. So fruit of salvation, knowing Jesus means loving his bride. That's one reason membership is biblical. The early church knew who was in and who was out. I've given you a lot of examples of that. Church membership is biblical. There was mutual commitment in the church. It's not just this relationship I don't care about. It's not as defined as marriage. And yet it is important. And fourth reason that church membership is biblical is because of leadership. Church leaders need to know for whom they are accountable. Now, I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me. Maybe just a little bit. But think about this. Jesus will hold church leaders like me accountable for shepherding his flock. But how are the shepherds supposed to know for whom they are supposed to shepherd if the sheep continually avoid getting involved in a flock? So listen to 1 Peter 5. It's a passage there under number 4 I have for you. 5, 1 through 4. Therefore I exhort the elders or pastors among you as your fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, a partaker of the glory to be revealed. I exhort you, pastors, he says. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for gain, but with eagerness, not lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And get this. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So maybe feel sorry for me a little bit. Jesus is going to hold me accountable for how I shepherded his sheep. And some some sheep are like, I ain't getting in your flock. I ain't getting in any flock. It's like, ah, my Lord's coming back and holding me accountable for you. Help the shepherds out. (laughs) Our chief shepherd is coming back and he's got expectations of us. 
Church membership is biblical, finally, because of fifth. So much of what the New Testament calls us to do as believers, we can't do unless we know the people in our church. People have this sort of free love idea of church hopping. I'm just going to go with the flow. The Bible's all about love. I might be in this church for a little while, and then I'll be over in that church for a little while, and then I'll, I'll be over here for a week. And the thing is, like I said, the Bible is all about committed love. What ends up happening when we church hop like that, and again, I'm saying today, you may not even be called to join this church. I really am okay with that. But I care that you are called to join a church because it's biblical. The thing that happens when we church hop like that is that our, if we're the hand, into which one of those bodies is our hand actually serving, actually giving of ourself, we might be taking a lot of benefit from the different traits of the different churches. We're going to talk about that next week. But where are we giving of ourselves? That's what the Bible calls Christians to do for each other in the local church, to love even when it hurts. Alelon is a Greek word. It's one word for one another. Two words in English, uh, but only one in Greek. The, the New Testament uses alelon a, a little over a hundred times to describe what we are to do for each other. Do blank for one another, alelon, in the church. And there are all kinds of commands. I read to you earlier John 13. Listen, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, you also are commanded to love one another. Second time, by this all men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. I'll lay alone three times in those two verses in John 13. In 1 Corinthians 11 that we looked about, he's talking about the Lord's Supper. He says, wait for one another before beginning communion. 1 Corinthians 11 33. Well, how do you wait for each other before beginning communion unless you have some idea about who the other people are? You got to know them. Our Galatians 6 2 commands us to bear one another's burdens. How do you do that unless you know the people that you're supposed to be bearing their burdens? We are a family of God, it talks about in, in the scripture. And we know how to take care of each other in our family. But wouldn't it be so weird if I went around in my truck yelling out to the children, Hey children, come to me. I've got candy in my van. I want to be your father. It's weird, isn't it? It's not right. You can get arrested for that. But in the church, we understand we have a relationship as family with one another. If you would turn over to Romans chapter 12, this will be the last passage I really would love for you to look at. Romans 12, 4 and 5. It's one of my favorite passages on the church. Romans 12, 4 and 5. It says this. For just as we have many members in one body... And all the members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ. And catch the end of 12.5. And we are individually members of one another. Is church membership biblical? Absolutely. We are members of one another. Community with commitment. I realize all this could sound really selfish. I'm pastor and I'm saying the Bible says you must join my church. It's not what we're saying today. We're just saying in general church membership is biblical. If someone doesn't want to join our church, okay, that's okay. Please join a good one. To God's glory, I think we have several churches in Santa Fe worth joining that preach the gospel. I love many of our fellow pastors in town. It's like eating. I don't care where someone eats. I care that people eat. We need physical nourishment in the same way we need the spiritual nourishment of the church. I would also rather someone be a member someone somewhere else than visit here forever. I said, you can visit here forever. You can. 
But God calls us to love a defined people, real people in a local body to use our gifts, to care for hurting believers. It's been a rough season out of COVID. I tried to define for us last week. We have people grieving in this church who need our love. They need our ministry to one another. A friend of mine used to teach a, a men's group, about a dozen or so men in a small group in his church on the East Coast, all guys in their 20s and 30s. And uh, one of the matriarchs of their church uh, got sick and had to go into the nursing home. An older lady, but one that uh, had been around the church. And so this uh, man who led this small group knew her. And he said to his men's group, hey, I've noticed so-and-so isn't here. Does anybody know what happened? And somebody said, yeah, she's gone into the nursing home. And so Jonathan decides that they're going to take their men's group, about a dozen young single and young married men, into a nursing home on a Friday night just to see this lady. They went and they had their Bible study and prayer time with this lady in one of the kind of tables out in the common area in a nursing home. And the lady reported this. When all those guys left... All the other people in the nursing home wheeled up to her or walkered up to her and they said to her, who are you? Are you famous? How did you get all these good looking young single men to come see you on a Friday night? Who are you? She said, I'm not famous. I'm just a member of a great church. We love each other. And they just knew I hadn't been there and they came to love me. And she said, let me tell you, I feel loved. You know, what is required to join our church? We're going to talk about that the next several weeks, but you've already heard me say it. It is to believe on Christ to save you, be baptized and to come to the new member class at a certain point. But the bottom line about church membership is that we are not talking about some kind of secular club or membership that we get from somewhere. We're talking about these passages that I've gone over today and the things that the New Testament calls us to do and be for each other. That's who we want to be here at FBC. We love you. If you're visiting with us today, man, you can keep visiting. It's okay. I know that you, you maybe should be a little bit hesitant to know what a church is about before you join. But I also hope as you feel comfortable and you feel the spirit of Jesus here, that you would say, I feel like I want to love this flock. I want to love this bride. I want to use my gifts and abilities here. Becoming a church member is biblical because it's fruit of our salvation. Loving the bride. The early church knew who was in and who was out. They kept lists as imperfect as it was. Jesus and Paul talk about a very clear boundary in the context of actually removing people from the church. There there was mutual commitment. Church leaders, forth, have to know whom they're accountable for. And finally, the only way to live out the one another's of the New Testament is to know who the one another's are. And I'll close with this. There's a a village in southern Europe that boasted of a church called the House of Many Lamps. When it was built in the 16th century, the architect had a pretty amazing idea. He provided no light in this church except for a receptacle that was at the back of every seat inside of the church. Every Sunday night as the people gathered, they would bring their lanterns and slip them into the back of the bracket on their seat. When someone stayed away from church for whatever reason, their place would literally be darkened. If many people stayed away, the darkness became greater. It was the regular presence of each person in the church and the spirit of God inside of them that literally lit up that church. I love that picture of the community that each of you bring to our church. You light us up church. Thank you for being a part. I make no bones about it. I hope you'll join our church. But more than that, committing to a group of Christians is biblical. I pray that you can see that today. And I pray that this will become a part of how you pray about your involvement at FBC and in churches for the rest of your life. I'm so thankful to be a part of this group of people at this place. You are the church. Let's pray.
God, we thank you for the fact that when you call us to be Christians, you never call us to walk alone. You call us to each other. You call us to support and help one another in ways that we have gifts and we're good at. And you call us to forgive each other for the things we're not good at. You call us to help. Jesus, most of all, you call us to you. And the church is a physical, literal representation of your work amongst imperfect people. We see that you are good and living and active because you're at work all around us in the church. And the church is a foretaste, a promise of us gathering again today at the marriage, one day at the marriage supper of the Lamb. When we will be adorned as your bride for our husband and we will be made perfect. There will be no more mourning or crying or pain. When we're together now, we get little foretastes of that day. Thank you, Jesus, for our church family. We love each other in your name. If you'd keep your head bowed and your eyes closed, we're going to enter into our time of response and invitation. We just ask you to think about the, the passages of Scripture that we've looked at today. What might God be calling you to do in response to His Word? Maybe it's to become a Christian for the first time. Maybe it's to get baptized as those first believers did. Maybe it's your day to join this church or another church family. Whatever God is calling you to do, as we have our time of response, I pray that you will commit to being obedient to Him. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Here's what's happening in the life of our church, not a building or a club or an event, but a family on mission together with God. Man. This Wednesday, October 26th, the choir is practicing at 7 p.m. There is no youth that night, no youth that night. 
This Saturday, October 29th, the Homeless Shelter Lunch Ministry is uh, needing a couple of folks to help them prepare and serve a meal at Pete's Place this Saturday. If you're interested in helping, please contact Susan Peterson. Her contact info is there in the bulletin. Also happening this Saturday is our fall family night, uh, a.k.a. Trunk or Treat, uh, in the parking lot from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Uh, everyone's invited. We're going to have some fun time together, uh, playing games, seeing cars decorated, and uh, be fun for everybody and the whole family. The missions team is planning a Navajo Mission work day coming up on Saturday, November 12th. And so they'll be doing some construction and sewing. If you're interested, please reach out to Karen Lafferty. Karen, is she in here? Just want to make sure she's in the back. All right. Uh, thanks, Thanksgiving's coming up. And with that, our church does Thanksgiving basket nominations. And so be praying about who you may want to nominate a person or a family who could be loved or encouraged by a Thanksgiving basket. More info to come on that soon. Um, new and prospective and existing member class was this morning out in the CLC in the gym. We had a great turnout of connection groups and new folks and just a wonderful time of, of fellowship and getting to know each other's names, loving each other. And so if you missed this morning, that's okay. You're still invited. You can come next Sunday, 9.15, 9.15 a.m. in the CLC in our gym. Um, light breakfast will be provided. Um, and lastly, Robert Leone. Where's Robert? Come on down here, brother. Um, Robert's going to come up, give us a short uh, giving testimony and tell you more about our proposed church budget. Thank you. Morning, church family. My name is Robert Leon, and I serve on our church finance committee. Um, our stewardship emphasis for this next year is entitled Give Freely and You Will Be Blessed from Acts 20, 35, which reads, In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, one advantage of serving God from a very young age, uh, going back to my teenage years, is that when you get to this point in your life, you have so many experiences where God has intervened and his faithfulness has been so good, you could literally spend days and weeks telling about all these various things about how good God is and how it is so much more blessed to give than to receive. But when we first started out in our married life, I was 20 years old, and so at that point in our life, we didn't have much. And we had made a commitment as a couple that we would be faithful to God in our tithing, no matter how difficult uh, finances seemed to be in our life. But as I look back over these last 45 years, I can say without a doubt that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And above all, you just cannot outgive our great big God. There have been so many times um, where we've had plenty. There have been times where things were tight. Um, but whether it was through God's engineering of circumstances on our behalf or the receipt of unexpected funds or even a gift of groceries, um, he's been there. And I can tell you it's, it's my testimony that God is faithful without a doubt and I think that um, he's just been so good to Vivian and I throughout these 45 years of marriage. But I can assure you he'll provide um, and you will be blessed and humbled by his goodness and his faithfulness to you. And I could stand up here and share hundreds, maybe thousands of examples of God's goodness where he showed us it was more blessed to give than to receive. But Real quickly, recently I decided to exit the workforce and retire. Um, and in doing so, you prepare for how you're going to survive. And so one um, area I had filled out paperwork where I set a certain date that I thought was the effective date of my first check. 
<laughs> and as it turns out, that was the effective date, but your first check doesn't come till 30 days later. So, um, hey, if you're going to exit the workforce, uh, you better be prepared to live longer than 30 days, right? So <laughs> no big deal. Um, but within two weeks of that discovery, we got notice that um, we would be getting a check for 20% over what that monthly income would have been. So I can tell you God is faithful no matter where we find ourselves. And even when we don't need his goodness, he's there with us. So at any rate, I pray that you'll join our church, our church family at this time in exploring how you can see where God will bless you and that you will be rewarded for your faithfulness in giving. Um, so as we prepare for this upcoming year, in both four years, you'll see copies of our upcoming budget. And we'd invite you to take those home, take a look at them, and see how you think you could participate throughout this next coming year. And that would give us an opportunity to plan better on how to be good stewards within our church. So. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Amen, church family. Uh, we've kept you long enough. We're going to have our benediction and be dismissed. Stand with me if you would. You are the church. Thanks for gathering today. Jesus, you said to us, love one another as I have loved you. Wow. We trust you to give us all we need to do that. And may we do it in the name of Christ. Amen. Have a great week. Thanks for being in church today.